Bibles, open it to John chapter 1. We're going to go walk through the book of John today. And uh, so uh, I want us to talk about this statement about uh, he came into his own and his own received him not. He came into the world. Verse 10 says that when he came into the world, uh, uh, well, verse, verse, 11, verse 11 said he came to his own and his own did not receive him. The world did not know him is what verse 10 says. Look at the latter part of verse 10. The Son of God was on this earth. We sang about it a moment ago, a moment ago did we not? Jesus, name above all name, Emmanuel. You know what that means, don't you? Emmanuel means God with us. And you and I need to understand that the word that was there, John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning with God who, and he himself was God, that that word through whom all things were made and not uh, anything has been made that was not made through him, he lived on this earth. And, and it, it marvels my mind, it stretches my mind beyond all imagination to think about the universe and think about all of those pictures of the, of the grandeur of the universe. And then you begin to narrow it down and there are all of the galaxies and then you look at a rather relatively small galaxy called the Milky Way and you look at the hundreds of millions of stars in the Milky Way, and there's one star we call the sun, and on that, uh, orbiting that sun at 93 million miles away is a little speck of dust called Earth. Can you imagine the creator of the entire universe living on a speck of dearth, dust we call Earth? My mind just cannot grasp the grandeur of it. And yet when he was here, nobody recognized. He came to his own. He was sent as a Jew to, pre to preach among the Jews. And, uh, and they did not honor him. They did not appreciate him. And yet verse 14, look at verse 14 says, We beheld his glory. There were those who saw what he was. The glory as of the only begotten of the, of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's remarkable, isn't it? He lived on this earth. When Emmanuel, God in the flesh, lived on this earth, he walked just like we did. He was there walking around the Sea of Galilee as well as walking on the Sea of Galilee. He was there on the mountains which he himself had made and where he proclaimed that, that uh, well-known sermon on the mount. And yet, folks didn't really recognize him. Who was there? Here's what I want us to talk about today. I want us to individually look at some, not all, but some of the people in the book of John who saw Jesus. I mean, the introduction to the book of John says, he lived on this earth and we saw his glory. Well, tell me, what did you see? Well, I saw his glory. Let's talk to those characters. Look first in John chapter 3 and verse 2. In John chapter 3, there is that man Nicodemus. The Bible says that, that he was a teacher of Israel. Jesus described, described him as that. And the Bible says that he came to Jesus by night. Here's an interesting character. There's been all kinds of speculations about why he came uh, to Jesus by night. But in the book of John, he's one of the first characters that beheld his glory. He's one of the first characters that, that, that saw Jesus. Now, it's ironic that he's one of the last characters that, uh, that saw Jesus uh, before he was in the tomb. John chapter 19, verse 39 says, This Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, uh, about a hundred pounds, and they took the body of Jesus. So here's Nicodemus in the early part, if we think John is chronologically, though it's not necessarily chronological. Luke is far more chronological as, as far as the order in which the events happen. But early in the book of John, there's this man, Nicodemus. And he comes to Jesus and he encounters Jesus. Wonder what impressions you would have the first time you saw Jesus. Had you lived in that first century, 
What would have been the first impression that you have of Jesus? Nicodemus said, Rabbi, recognizing that he was a teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. And then he says this, For no man can do the wonders, the signs that you are doing, except God is with him. I want you to stop and think about this. Nicodemus is not coming to one who necessarily at this point recognizes the deity of Jesus. He's an individual who is a rabbi. He's an individual who, uh, uh, or, or a teacher of, the, of Israel, perhaps not a rabbi, but is a teacher of Israel. And he is one who instructs others. And yet there is this man, Jesus, on this earth that is doing something that is amazingly marvelous, and that is the overabundance of miracles that he did. In fact, John says, does you not, in the end of this book, that if you tried to write a book that had everything that Jesus did in it, the book would be so big that the world itself could not contain, contain that very book. Perhaps a hyperbole, but you stop and think of how many things Jesus did we don't know anything about. Do you know that uh, we only know all together, we only know 30 days of the life of Jesus and yet he lived on this earth for more than 30 years and we are allowed to look at one month of his life, if you put them consecutive together, Nicodemus had seen some things and he understood the nature of these miracles. You see, there had been very few miracles since the time of Elijah and Elisha and then of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I do not mean that God is not working on this earth. But all of a sudden, there is this overabundance of miracles that, that uh, Jesus is doing. And Rabbi and, and, and Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And Nicodemus says, we know, not we wish, not we suspect, but he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the things with the signs that you are doing unless God is with him. Nicodemus, you have met Jesus and Nicodemus, if you wanted to tell us about Jesus in your encounter with Jesus, tell us what you would know. And the answer is, I know that Jesus is from God. Now I want you to stop and think about that. Here's a book that is written, John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, in order that we might believe. And the early introduction in the book of John is, a, is an affirmation. We know that you are a teacher come from God. Now it's amazing this very chapter that there's an amplification of all of this that, that is in reference to Jesus. Whenever the, the Bible talks about the fact in verse, 14, verse 15, uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You look at the statements that, that are made here, and you see an affirmation of the deity of Jesus when Jesus said in verse 16, uh, that, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Can we look in the next chapter? In the next chapter is that Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. It's ironic in relationship to the study of this chapter of all the things that's transpiring because the Jews have no relationship with the Samaritans. We've lived in a, in a time where there is much racial prejudice perhaps, but perhaps not nearly as much as there was in this first century. And so here's this Samaritan, not a Jew, not a Gentile, but a half-caste part Jew, part Gentile. You know, the Jews don't really accept her for sure. In fact, they call them dogs and they will not even walk through the, through the countryside where the Samaritans are found. And the, and, the, and the Gentiles look at them as not really, really being uh, equal to the other Gentile nations. You're a half caste. And all of a sudden, that woman comes to that well to draw water. And Jesus asked her that she might give him some water and she says, how is it that you being a Jew, she understands racial prejudice, 
How is it that you being Jew, a Jew, would ask water of me? And Jesus said, if you really knew who you were talking to, you would understand that I have water to give to you. It's living water that if you drink that water, you'll never ever thirst again. And if you put yourself in the place of that woman, it may be that uh, her response is indicative of the fact she didn't understand the spiritual words that Jesus was speaking. Because she'd had to come from that city and come out of the city just to the place where the well was to get the water. wonder how many times she'd done that in the previous week, in the previous month, in the previous years. How often did she make, those, that, make that trip? And all of a sudden Jesus said, I have some water and if you'll drink it, you'll never thirst again. You'll never have to make this long trip. But then Jesus began to talk to her. And in the discussion that he had with her, he points out the fact that that woman had, uh, uh, had been married five times. And the man that she was with was, was not her husband. Here is this woman that has an encounter with Emmanuel. She goes back into the city. And when the woman goes back into the city, she tells those people in that city, he told me all that I ever did. John chapter five and verse, John chapter four and verse 39. Samaritan woman, tell us about this man, Jesus. Give me your impressions. Nicodemus says he's from God. The woman comes back and he says, or she says, he knows everything about me. You want an introduction to the very nature of Jesus? One moment's conversation with the master, with Emmanuel, and she says, Jesus knows everything about me. He's from God. And he knows everything about me. Look at the knowledge that he says that, that this, this one has of me. And then understand that here is the first impression of the encounter with Jesus. Can we go to John chapter 7? We'll have to skip some of the, some of the events. But in John chapter 7, Jesus is having a profound impact in John chapter 7 on the people that are listening to him. The, the, it's amazing. The impact of his words and the fact that his words were such that people are beginning to say, maybe this is the Messiah. How do we know that this is not the one that has been sent by God? And you read all of this chapter and finally, when you get to about verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. Verse 31, what things? When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? When the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. We've got to get rid of this imposter. He's a threat to us and he sends soldiers out to arrest Jesus. Now, look at the next several statements. And this is as far as we know, the only things they heard Jesus say. say verse 33, I shall be with you a little while longer and then I will go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Verse 36, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Verse 37, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then, verse, 40, verse 45, these soldiers... These officers came to the chief priest and the Pharisees who said to him, Where is he? We sent you to arrest him. Where is this man? Why have you not fulfilled the very thing that we asked you to do? And the officers said, The reason we have not arrested him, we have never heard anyone speak like he speaks. 
that much of an encounter with Jesus. Nicodemus had heard of him. Nicodemus came and in the conversation that Nicodemus had, Nicodemus went away and says, "This you are from God. The woman at the well says, you know, we know the Messiah is coming. Perhaps he is the Messiah. He knows everything about me. And these soldiers said, his words are the most powerful words that we've ever heard. They supersede the words of those who sent us to arrest him. Think about the words of Jesus. When Emmanuel lived on this earth, his words were, li- were unlike any other words ever spoken. The end of the Sermon on the Mount, they were astonished at his doctrine. He did not speak as the scribes and the Pharisees, but he spake as one who had authority. Encounter with Jesus. First impression of meeting God on this earth, the power of His words. What about John chapter 8? What about that woman that had been taken in the very act of adultery? Verse 2, early in the morning he came into the temple and the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery And when they had set set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. We need to understand that there is a physical action that is involved in the matter of adultery. She was committing adultery and we caught her and Moses said that she ought to be put to death. Did Moses say that? Oh, yes. You know what else Moses said? Both the man and the woman should be put to death. Where's the man? Where's the man? If they caught the woman in the act, the man had to be there with her. But they brought the woman to him and Jesus understands something that's happening here. This is not trying to say, well, let us, keep the law of, let us keep the law of Moses and let us glorify God and keep sin out of Israel. And he uses this very incident to show them, to show to them the very hardness of the heart that they had. Jesus, the Bible says in verse 6, that they said this testing him, that they might have something that they might accuse him of. Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And then when he looked up, there was nobody there except the woman. Do you know what he wrote on the ground? Would you like to know what he wrote on the ground? Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, will answer that for you. If you want to flip over there and look at it, I'm I'm going to keep going. But Deuteronomy 29, 29 tells exactly what he wrote on the ground. And when he looked up, when he looked up, there was nobody there. And Jesus said, where are those that condemn you? And they're gone. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Verse 11. That's remarkable. Woman, adulterous woman, Tell us of the first encounter you had with Jesus when God lived in the flesh. And she'd walk away saying, unlike those who are around me, unlike those who are condemning me, this man is a man filled with grace. First impression, the grace of Jesus. Look in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, there is that blind man. There are those individuals who in reference to this blind man, verse 1 thinks that he has a physical infirmity because either the sins of his parents are his own sins. 
Sometimes people today make that very wrong judgment. Who sinned, they said, this man or his parents. In fact, this shows the impact of that, that wrong idea, even in the lives of the apostles. These are his disciples that are saying, well now, tell us, did he sin or was it his parents? There's no other option. And Jesus says, oh yes, there is. And then he explains what that other option is. Then to the amazement, perhaps, of all those that are around in verse 6, he spits on the ground. And with that saliva and that dust that is there, he anoints the man's eyes and tells the man to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man goes and, and he washes in the, in, in the pool of Siloam. Whenever, whenever they come to him and said, who did this? In fact, they said, is this really, are you really the blind man? They ask his parents, is, is this really your son? And the answer given is, here's what we know when you ask about his nature, and that is, we know that he, that, that he made the eyes of this blind man to open. The amazing thing is, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. That's a remarkable things that they have done. They've set him aside, cast him out. He's a reprobate. He's not worthy of, of uh, uh, you know, of, of any, decent, any fellowship with any common folks. Cast him out. And Jesus comes and he found him. He says, do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, the one you have talked to, and it's interesting that he says, and the one that you are looking at, he is the Son of God. One moment encounter with Jesus. He's deity. He's deity. Look in John chapter 11. Mary and Martha, you know the story as well as I do. This is not a momentary encounter with, uh, uh, with, with Jesus, for they had known him, and there was a great, deep, abiding friendship. But their brother has died. And when Jesus arrives at the house, John chapter 11, both of them show that, uh, that they believed in the resurrection. They're Pharisees in that sense. They believe in the resurrection. And they said to the Lord, we know it will be raised in the last day. They have some understanding of the, of the last day, the final resurrection, what's going to happen. And if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. And so it's obvious that they understand who Jesus is. And they're not, they're not like the, the blind man who says, I don't even know who the Son of Man is. They are aware of that. But the point that we want to emphasize here, John eleven thirty five. 35... Jesus wept. Do you know what deity is like? Do you know what Emmanuel is like? Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And it is this one moment of their life, they understand the compassion of God. Look at that list. They under, these who have encountered Jesus know he's from God, that he knows all things about all people, that his words are powerful, that he's full of grace, that he is divine, and he's compassionate. Look in John 13. We're in that upper room. Jesus washes the feet of the disciples and we look especially at when he comes to Peter and he said, Peter says to him, verse 8, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered and said, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Jesus said, He who is bathed, after Peter says, Wash me all over, he said, You've already had a bath. What's dirty is your feet. I need to wash your feet that you may be completely clean. And so Jesus washed his feet. Peter had known him. Peter was the one who had said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was the one who had said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter was the one who was to say this very night, Though all men forsake you, I will never forsake you. 
You know what Peter saw happen? Peter saw the humility of Jesus. Listen, when God became man and dwelt on the face of a speck of dust, God washed the feet, not just of Peter, but the feet of Judas. What's Jesus like? We've met Jesus in in this lesson and we've looked at just isolated incidents that would take only a moment or so to happen. And you walk away and you see the grandeur of Jesus. What is God like? God weeps. And that's why he tells us to weep with them that weep, for that is a godly, godly action. Then finally, we don't have time to fully develop this, but in John chapter 20, there is when he appears to Mary Magdalene, the woman out of whom he had cast seven demons. She is the one who sees the resurrected Jesus first. Look at that incident in her life. Whenever she does not recognize him, she thinks he's the gardener. And finally, she recognizes who he is. We owe an unbelievable debt to these women who came to the tomb. They are the connecting link between the burial of Jesus, for they were there at his burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, for they were the first ones at the tomb and the first one to see the resurrected Lord. Mary, tell us what Jesus is like. I am the resurrection and the life. Now let me ask you a question. It's been theoretical thus far. What is your encounter with Jesus? We've read these stories and they're just words on a piece of paper and yet they live. The Word of God is living and active and you've met Jesus. In times you've read the Bible, in classes you've been in, in sermons that you've heard, at times whenever you've just been you and the Lord, you've met the Lord. Have you encountered the Lord and have you seen the fullness of the Lord? Do you believe He's from God? Do you know that He understands everything about you? He is omniscient. Are you aware of the fact that His words are living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it is His words? Never man spake like this man His eternal words, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not. That his words will judge us in the last day, John 12, 48. You've met Jesus. Are you aware that he is full of grace to those who come to him? Are you really aware of the fact that he was God in the flesh? A speck of dust in the magnitude of the universe. And he came and lived on this earth. Deity walked the streets and the roads and the paths of Galilee and of Judea. You've met Jesus. Do you understand how compassionate he is? Do you understand that He would wash your feet? And do you understand that it is His resurrection that gives you hope on this earth? You believe that? Then why would you not give your life to deity? Someday you'll see Him. There will be another encounter called the Judgment Day. You will see Him. 
but will you not see him in the fullness of his loving, compassionate graciousness for the next time you see him, maybe on the day of judgment when he'll be the judge, your judge, to judge you by the words that he's spoken. You know what he said? He says you need to believe in him. John 3, 16, he says you need to repent of your sins. So many verses say that. Luke 13, 3, from the very lips of Jesus, except you repent, you'll perish. You need to confess that you believe Jesus is the Son. Rabbi, we know that you are from God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Confess that you believe that. And then you can be baptized into a relationship with Him in His kingdom, in His body, the church. And he says then to those of us who've done that, don't you forget, remember me. That's what this feast is all about. Do this, remembering me. Remembering what about him? Well, so many multifaceted things you could remember about him. But in the book of John, we've looked at these things that those who encountered him for a moment's time walked away and said, let me tell you what Jesus is like. What's Jesus like to you? Won't you let him be your Lord and your Savior? You need to obey the gospel in any way. Won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing. Will you come?